Dee Dee Pursehaus has um, spoken at our conference before. She's an educator, she's um, an acupuncturist and healer, and she's just written, written well, not just, it's about a year old now, right? Yes. Um, a wonderful book called The Ecology of Care, and is integrating humans and environment and microbes and soils and everything all at once, and so you're in for a treat. And Thank you. Uh, I'd like to actually start uh, because I know you've all been just he hearing people talking at you uh, uh, with very, very interesting things, but sometimes it's hard for us to, to process a lot of information at once. So I would love it if you would just turn to somebody near you and um, Pick who's going to speak first, and just take a moment to answer this question. Just come up with two or three things that you think, what you think we really want and need in life. And I'll tell you when to switch and let the other person talk. OK, let's bring our attention back. And. Um, what are some of the things that you came up with? Friendship. What else? Love. Nice. Leave a better place for my grandchildren. Beauty. Harmony. Goodness. Empowerment. Great. So let's talk a little bit about how to get those things. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of this comes back to whether or not we are connected to each other and to the environment around us. And those connections are much more complex, as I'm sure you've been hearing all day and last night than, than we sometimes think they are. We sometimes just think on a human scale. But um, there's a reason that mammals uh, love connection, is that uh, when we're in the womb, our microbiome, our, the, the microbes that live in our bodies and on our bodies, are already, it's already starting to develop in the womb. And then as we come out the birth canal, we're coated with um, an incredible coating of microbes that, that are going to help us get through the world. And very importantly, when we breastfeed, there's at least 600 species of beneficial bacteria in breast milk. So these, these connections start right in the womb with, with other people, but also with uh, the work of other species. So we're dependent on the work of other species right from the start. And uh, how does that get populated through the rest of our lives? Well, so as we, as we start to become a little more independent, we're not just sucking on our mother, we're sucking on our hands and on our dog's nose and on everything that we can find all over the house or the world or the garden or we're chewing on little things we find outside. Um, traditionally, as we got older, the microbiome is repopulated through the foods that we eat. So eating fresh foods from outside would traditionally populate the microbiome, but also uh, things that are preserved with lactobacilli, which are a very beneficial group of bacteria, and, and also a lot of interesting yeasts and other things. So uh, that's, that included a lot of things that now are no, long, no longer have those microbial properties. So all of the things that we think of as condiments, like ketchup and relish and chutney and salsa and uh, mustard, those would have all typically been lacto-fermented foods that were replenishing our good bacteria. And um, those bacteria, as, as you've probably been hearing about both here and in other places, they do kind of an extraordinary amount of work in our bodies and for our lives. So they are very important to our immune system, 
to our digestive system. They regulate our blood sugar and how we take in different things. So the side effects that you have to a drug that are different from someone else, that's because you have a different microbiome. They turn on our brain function. They make most of our brain chemicals. This is a really important relationships. So I want to just step back a little bit and tell you where, how I got here. Um, I'm going to take you for a little walk down to the Ampampanusik River, which is behind my clinic. I've been working for 23 years or so as a holistic health care provider in Vermont. And we swim in the river in summer and in fall. And in winter, we occasionally break the ice and jump in, but mostly we throw snowballs and play. In spring, maybe not quite as much swimming because it can get a little wild in spring. Um, in 2011, something happened with my beautiful river that was <laughs> a little different. And um, as we just heard, that sometimes these floods and hurricanes can be an incredible opportunity. And that's exactly what happened to me, was I saw something happen in Vermont with um, Tropical Storm Irene that I had no idea that the Ampampanusik River or the other rivers around me was capable of doing this kind of change in the landscape. And one thing just to notice in this slide is where did the, where did the erosion happen? It happened in the places where things weren't growing. So that was one of the things I started to notice as I was driving around after the storm. Again, here you can see that this road, you know, like eight feet deep of erosion, but where the woods are, it was pretty straightforward and stayed intact. And I basically, from that point on, every time I drove or walked through the landscape, all I could think about was what's going to happen the next time that it rains here? And what is this relationship between water and soil? And that led to a complete change in career. Uh, Four years ago, I decided to work on soil health and public health. I was writing this book, The Ecology of Care, and started adding in chapters about soil and climate change and climate change and public health. And, um, and thinking about opportunities that you've been hearing about. There's so, I loved that presentation we just heard. To create landscapes that soak up the rain and do something different when storms hit. So just a quick review, um, the plants sip carbon out of the air, add water and sunlight, and turn it into life. So we often think that plants are grown from the soil, but that just provides a tiny bit of minerals, um, mostly, mostly plants and everything that eats plants and everything that eats things that eats plants is made out of air and water, including us. And so then that life takes those, all of those other structures and rearranges them and creates a matrix that influences how water flows through the landscape. And so that can happen on a major big level, like with beavers or with humans, but it can also happen on a very small level where microbes take the sand, silt, and clay and stick them together into a sponge that will soak up the rain. And this is one of my favorite slides and one of my favorite things that the NRCS is going around and doing. They have a soil health team and they do these rainfall simulators. You can see that in the soil where, the, where microbes and plants and worms and all, all the kingdoms of life have been working way over on your left side, the water that's soaking through going down after you've rained on this um, there's plenty of water in that, in that uh, jar over there, and there's no runoff. And, if you, and then the, you come all the way across and you'll see it sort of gradually goes over to this one where there's no microbial or plant life. This is a, a field that is um, continuously tilled, lots of chemicals, and there's no water soaking through. This is about three or four inches of rain have been artificially put on these pans. They're open at the bottom. They have a slot at the front. And at the front, you have an incredibly dirty, a lot of soil leaving the landscape. And we have, been, we have been managing our land 
um, in ways that are assuming this kind of system when really, so this is like a runoff system of managing water when really we should be managing an infiltration system of water because there's incredible other co-benefits to that. So um, the filtration of the water, the uh, biodiversity that that produces, the resistance to flooding and drought, um, dra dramatically increased uh, nutrient density of food because of all of the work that's happening in that landscape. And here you have a landscape that's really not doing work at all. And um, that a lot of that work happens because all living things exude slimes and snots and glues. And, <laughs> um, and it's very similar to our to our guts and to our to the other parts of our body that have these mucosal membranes. So if you think about the soil as the mucosal membrane of the land, uh, it's kind of the same thing when we think about if we take antibiotics and we kill off our own bacteria, we lose that protective membrane in all the parts of our body that need it, and we start to have problems. And similarly, if we do that to the soil, if we till the land or do um, use a lot of chemicals or don't feed it with growing plant roots, then we lose out on that mucosal membrane property. So if we think about um, microbes and all the other species that they work with as the quiet, hidden, working class of the world, providing our goods and services, all, the, all of those benefits that we, think, uh, we, that we think we need to provide as humans uh, actually are the, the land itself is capable of doing for us. So clean water, food, protection, uh, materials to make things, right? Uh, nutrient density, connection, beauty, all of those things that we talked about. So um, there are principles, just like there are principles for human health to keep soil healthy. And uh, one of the things I've been working on for the last three years is uh, a workbook that you can use in classroom, but you can also use for adult learning groups of, um, and there's copies of it right back there, called Understanding Soil Health and Watershed Function. And that is principle-based, not practice-based. So if you have principles, you can use them anywhere. So you don't have to figure out what do I do here and what do I do there. You can think through principles such as providing shelter, moisture, and nutrition for soil life by keeping it covered year round. So I'm not gonna read through all of these, but you can read through them back there. And it's a free downloadable PDF. Um, so one of the things I talk about in my book is this fertile paradigm of care where we're collaborating with the work of other species. And um, let's, let's talk about what happened to that, right? So for, for thousands and thousands of years, we have lived in concert with other species. And uh, let's just take an example of where we're at now. Glyphosate is also known as Roundup. It's, it's what's you, a lot of the GMO crops are uh, Roundup ready. And um, the history, I'll tell you a little story if you don't know. Um, it was originally patented as something to descale, a descalant for industrial pipes. So it binds to minerals. You know how your teapot gets, uh, gets crusty after a while? It's just like putting vinegar in your teapot. It binds to the minerals and it, t and it takes them. Um, and Monsanto then saw that and said, hey, you know, there's this pathway in plants that is called the shikimate pathway that, that is mineral-based. And if we, could, we could interfere with that, we could kill off plants. So they took glyphosate and repatented it as a weed killer. Uh, then they started thinking and said, you know, it doesn't just do that in plants, it does it in, um, in microbes too. So then they repatented it again, and you can read all these patents online. They repatented it as a broad-spectrum antimicrobial, so an antibiotic. 
Uh, the trouble is it didn't really get under the market because it kills off all the good bacteria and it leaves all the bad bacteria. So it wasn't a very, the kind of antibiotic that was going to be very useful in medicine. Um, but meanwhile, it was already in vast usage as, as a weed killer. Um, so then the last patent was a, as, a, as a desiccant to dry crops like barley and things like that. Uh, so that you can harvest them quickly without having to wait for them to dry. So um, now we have a food system where uh, a tremendous amount of our food has this broad spectrum antibiotic that kills off the good bacteria uh, that, has, that is being sprayed on after harvest in dramatic qualities and that is, that is being used to grow the plants because it's, it's spraying down all, all around those, resist, those plants that resist the glyphosate. So when we think about what uh, the microbiome does in our body, right? when we think about all of the mental functions, all of the protective functions, the immune system functions, um, someone thought, hey, let's see, now this is correlation, not causation, but let's plot a graph of, what, of how these diseases um, are increasing along with the use of glyphosate. And when you get numbers like 0.99 and 0.97, um, the correlation starts shifting into um, that there is definitely, it, it, these are definitely connected, that it's not, it's, not, um, it's not just sort of a general, you know, like, yeah, they're sort of going up. Now, um, We'll go a little further. So some of these are the diseases that we are thinking of constantly now as being um, the, the diseases that are really increasing in incidence a lot. So is it related to glyphosate? It looks like it is. I think, you know, we'll, we, we will likely find out. Um, there have been lots of animal studies as well in which they've been able to reproduce a lot of this. So this is just one one person's thing. There's a there's a wonderful video online by Terry Vrain, T H T H I E R R Y Vrain, called "Engineered Food and Your Health: The Nutritional Status of GMOs." Um, just came out um, a couple weeks ago in the, the AMA, um, talking about pesticides and reproductive health. And pesticides is a general word. Um, for anything that kills off anything that's considered a pest. So a, so a weed killer, a fungicide, a worm, deworming, those are all pesticides. And uh, they found that regular consu consumption of conventionally grown pesticide-treated fruits and vegetables associated with an increased risk of pregnancy loss. And get this, the AMA is saying, while consumption of organic fruits and vegetables significantly reduced their, this risk. So that's a pretty big deal. And there was a very strongly worded uh, editorial in there along with that. So um, how did we get to this place where we're killing off whatever we don't want? Well, another story, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, a lot of people moved to the cities. And one of the main issues there was that there wasn't enough fresh food in the cities because you were no longer in a farm agricultural landscape. And the big one that everyone missed, back to that first slide, was milk. We miss it because it reminds us of connection and because it reminds us of that early population of our microbiome. That's what I'm guessing. Um, so someone figured out this clever idea, let's put dairies right next to the whiskey distilleries in the cities and we can feed the slop from the dairies, the slop from the distilleries to the cows. So these were like the very first feedlots. Um, the problem was that the germ theory of disease was not understood yet at all. And so um, this open, open vats of milk were being wheeled through city streets and um, unwashed ladles going in them and open sewers and people throwing their trash on the streets and somebody has a cold who works in the dairy and um, so so this raw milk being sold in the cities became a serious vector for disease and Louis Pasteur who was working on lacto fermentation processes at the time lost three of his children to foodborne illnesses 
And so he shifted his focus from, from fermentation, studying fermentation, to studying food safety. And he figured out over time that if you um, heated milk to a high temperature or any, uh, or any food, that you would kill off what he then started talking about as bacteria. They would kill them off and you would have safe food. Well, this was a really big boon for a lot of things because it meant you could transport food much further, right? So it could be sent to the army far away and fight wars for longer. You could send it, you could have a big company that sent food all across the country. So, um, and then, then, uh, then they figured out, because they started thinking about germs, that if you wash your hands and sterilize your instruments before surgery, that surgery went better. People didn't die as easily. Uh, doctors who had been sort of part of the general ecology of care of um, midwives and herbalists and naturopaths and homeopaths, suddenly doctors were able to do surgeries. They were able to bring people back from, um, from death, to, you know, uh, close to death cir circumstances. And, uh, and war became easier, not just because of the being able to ship food, but also because when we uh, started understanding this, then, then penicillin became a commercialized drug and um, was available widely. And so you could deal with all of those war injuries and infections. Um, but there were some side effects uh, social side effects from that, and I'm just going to read a little directly from the book. Sorry. <laughs> Here we go. For years, I've taught that we need to honor and restore our inner ecosystems as well as our outer ecosystems in order to be healthy and vibrant. And I've proposed that the second wave of medical progress needs to focus on dealing with the side effects of the effective removal of germs from our soil, our food, our homes, and our bodies. We need to welcome in a wide variety of microorganisms as if they were our prodigal sons and daughters. And we need to welcome along with them the complexity and unpredictability of self-organizing communities and the communal mindset, symbiotic, symbiotic values, and creativity that come with them. Not just on the microbial level, because the campaign of sterility has extended far beyond the surgical theater and canning factories. It has swept through the offices of doctors and psychologists, into our homes, our schools, our lives, our landscapes, and even our hearts. During the same period that we took on the goals of conquering bacteria and subduing nature for our own human benefit, we developed a huge amount of fear and anxiety around dirt, sharing, closeness, wildness, and community living. Doctors started advising mothers to feed their babies clean formula from sterilized bottles. Children were put into cribs and away from the warm bodies they were meant to be with for fear of germs. Nursing homes with professional doctors were touted as cleaner, safer places for elders than having them live with their families. Housewives started scrubbing furiously with antiseptic products while teachers taught children to avoid strangers. Nurses started handing out forms to us for us to sign, promising layers of privacy and secrecy, and psychologists started installing extra doors in their offices so that clients never had to cross paths with each other. Now we're afraid of things that are complicated and messy. We're afraid of relationships themselves and have forgotten the lessons that our bacterial companions teach us. That life is complex, collaborative, creative process from inside to outside, from start to finish. From the inoculation of our digestive tracts with good bacteria in the birth canal, to the hard work of soil microorganisms that help to grow our food, and that will someday turn our bodies back into beautiful, fertile earth at the ends of our lives. 
Like the laboratory doves I took care of in college, many of us now spend our days in artificial surroundings, protected from germs with hand sanitizers, communicating with our friends from a distance, with our creativity expressing itself mostly by our choices of the industrially made foods we eat or reject. Really, though, we were born for something much more interesting. <laughs> so this fear um, became a driver of progress, and it's all based on new ideas and technology. Traditional ideas got thrown out because they were seen as somehow dangerous, right? I mean, when, when the doctor with his high-tech ideas can save your life, then uh, it's scary to go back to old ways. And fear is an intense driver of human behavior. Uh, the other thing that happened here is that this whole system of there being experts who knew how to save our lives changed our relationship to learning in some ways. Not that this hadn't already started, but it really set in hard at that point that scientists were the ones who knew what was right and what to do. And I think we can see right now that, you know, I'm up here speaking to you as if I'm some sort of an expert, but really everyone in this room has the same amount of knowledge, right? We've all been on the earth. And I love, one of the things I love about this conference is that we have this time at the end to come back into a circle and share learning. So on the landscape, this idea of there are best practices that only experts know um, shows that we, we haven't kept those soil health principles going. We've been trying to figure out best practices. And um, this is uh, Kansas in the month of June during the solstice. And you can see that the soil health principles are not being used here at all. The soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever, as Ray Archuleta says. So we're not feeding those microbes. We're not taking care of them. We're not allowing them to do the work that we need. And this is a quote from my colleague and partner, Peter Donovan. The issue is that over vast areas of the world, the biosphere is not doing enough work. With livestock confined and crop monocultures dependent on fossil energy to maintain them, too many of the animals are in prison, too many of the plants are in welfare, and too many of the microbes are dead. So what is holding back? I mean, we, ha we, we know so much about regenerative agriculture, and I've been traveling around the continent visiting regenerative farms, doing monitoring of microbial work, essentially. And um, the thing that I am hearing is not that farmers don't want to do this, not that they don't know how to do this. The issue is not that we smart East Coasters need to move to the Midwest and teach them how to do it. The issue is peer pressure. And connection is everything. And you can imagine in a small rural town where you, pr you plant a mixed species cover crop and then bring your cows in there to graze it down. And uh, people say, whoa, that is messy. That is not the way we do things around here. And I hear over and over again farmers who walk into a coffee shop and everyone turns their back on them. Farmers who went to their best friend from high school was, is now the fertilizer salesman. And at first, he's worried that this guy's stopping using fertilizer. And then he's pissed because this guy's talking about how well his business is going without fertilizer. And he thinks he's trying to put him out of business. Small towns, connections, deep connections. This is a really big deal. So what do we do here? Do we need to go out and tell farmers how to do this? Or do we need to set up mutual support and learning groups for where farmers can come together and figure stuff out together and find their people. So at some of the regenerative agriculture conferences, the farmers often say to each other, this is the only three days of the year where I feel normal. So we need to set up places where that can happen. We also need to provide more opportunities for people to think in systems. And that's the workbook that I've been working on provides that. Um, a lot of different exercises that you can go through, both hands-on and discussions, to help with that. This was a group I worked with in Chicago, and we divided up into uh, 
into small teams. I described a situation in Zimbabwe where Alan Savory had done, and Precious Perry did, did incredible work with grazing. And, and I described all the problems, not enough water, not enough food, health issues, biting ants, right? And uh, ec economic issues. And I said, you each be an agency and take care of one of those problems and give me back a budget. Gave them five or 10 minutes. They came back though, we're gonna start a military, we're gonna build a hospital, we're gonna get food from UNICEF, we're gonna bring in some, some uh, insect pesticides and um, insecticides and budgets you know, in the millions and billions of dollars. We just did this again with six high schools in California, right? In an area in California where you can't see the mountains because there's so much pollution in the air from the agriculture in the Central Valley. Then, um, so we reported back from those groups. Then I had Precious Peary, who spoke at this first conference here, Skype in and, and show the slideshow of what happened when they, when these uh, about 20 villages put all their herds of animals together, started working with natural systems, moving them through the landscape like a grazing herd, an old herd of animals would have, and how they addressed all these issues and more with uh, almost no budget on 200,000 acres of restoration now. So can we measure the work of other species and make it visible? I think we can. Um, this is Peter Donovan who started the Soil Carbon Coalition and now has an app called, called atlasbiowork.com um, where you can upload uh, geolocated data about soil and landscape function right onto a map and it's public open data. So um, do you have to be a certain age? Nope, we can do this um, with second graders looking at um, how much biodiversity is there on the soil surface or with adults in a cornfield looking at the same thing in a, in a hoop. Um, we can teach people how to um, set up transects and map things in order to do these plots. This is um, students figuring out how to set up a transect in a city park. Um, they had to each draw a map and f then follow each other's maps. It was pretty interesting. <laughs> Good way to learn how not to draw a map. <laughs> uh, same thing out in a farm. Um, it's really fun because you get to make your own tools and sharpen them and do stuff like that. Um, testing water infiltration in various places. How fast does an inch of water soak into this land? What would happen if an inch of rain fell? Um, testing the density of the soil, again, another way, another look at how much microbial work is creating that spongy matrix that we need. Testing for soil carbon, very popular these days. All right, I'm going to finish up with a, a story uh, from Oklahoma. I have a little secret, which is that I am fascinated with oil industry equipment. <laughs> and as I drive through the landscape, uh, whenever I see these guys working, I have to stop and get out and take a little video or take a picture. I just think they're so cool. They're like those, those birds that you, you know, that you buy, those little sippy birds, right, that go up and down. And they're just like really nice, slow movement. And, and they're always in these big open stretches of prairie where there's grazing happening. I've been to regenerative farms that have these going at the same time. So people are out there do, getting the soil carbon samples in, in rhythm with the oil pumps. <laughs> um, and um, so when I was in Oklahoma to do a, a professional development workshop for teachers about how to teach thinking in systems, my plan was to teach the water infiltration testing, uh, but I forgot to bring my infiltration rings because I thought that the guy who was hosting the workshop was gonna have some. And he said, no, I don't have any. And he said, well, may I could run back to my farm and cut up you know, some irrigation pipe, but it's really thick. We're not gonna be able to get into the ground. And I said, well, go at least do that. And we'll have something. And then I was driving by and I stopped to take my usual pictures here. And I, and I kind of poked my head in, because this was actually not, these weren't ones that were working, this was a place that makes them even cooler, right? So I poked my head in and I said, hey, they have some pipes in there. And they've got 
big metal cutting machines. <laughs> so, I, so I walked in, I asked this guy, I explained what I was doing, and um, I had been at uh, Kit Farrow's conference down the street, tiny, tiny town in Oklahoma. They were having this tiny little grazing conference, and, um, and he, he, I, he was, I was explaining what I was using them for, that it was for a soil health project. Uh, and he said, he said, oh, were you down at Kit Farrow's talk? And I said, yes, I was. Have you heard of that? And he said, oh, I'm all over that. I love soil health. I love what you guys are doing with regenerative agriculture. He said, if you're using this in schools, he said, you can tell any teacher in Oklahoma that if they need equipment to just call me, you know, I'll make up, I'll make it up, I'm not going to charge you for this, whatever I can do to help. So to me, um, this was a powerful reminder that we have allies in places we don't know. That we have allies in the microbes in our guts, we have allies in all the work that goes underground in the soil, we have allies at Monsanto, we have allies in the oil industry, and we need to stay open and keep our hearts open, stay curious, keep wandering into people's workshops and houses and saying, hey, what are you doing? And start those conversations and build those interconnections and those relationships because we can't do this by killing off what doesn't fit. We can't do this with this sterile paradigm of, of um, you're, you don't agree with me, therefore you have to get out of the room, right? We can't do this by killing off insects and then, and then killing off the, what we think of our weeds, which are really the first responders. We got, everybody's gotta be involved. And that means everybody. So we need to learn ways of working with each other where all the voices come in the room. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.